So next up, we have Professor uh, Sinit Armstrong. He's the Chauncey Stillman Professor of Practical Ethics at Duke University, and he runs a lab on artificial moral intelligence. Yep. Is, that, is that what it's called? Yeah, and he's done. It's called the Mayo Lab. It's the Mayo. Moral Artificial Intelligence Lab. Oh, wow. There you go. It's called Mayo. <laughs> I run Mayo. Yeah. <laughs> The postman is here. Exactly. So, and uh, well, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Walter's going to talk about whether should moral AI help us decide who gets a kidney. Let's welcome Walter. Thanks for coming. Um, I um, want to start off by just saying what interests me uh, in this project and, and why I think it might be useful. Uh, we've been working with some doctors in a hospital in Maryland uh, and, and talking to a bunch of the doctors at Duke as well. And one story particularly struck me that one person said, you know, they do kidney transplants. And what happens sometimes is they get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning and told, you know, there was a local accident. There's a kidney available. Which of your patients do you want it to go to? You've got 15 minutes. No, no, actually, the longer you take, the worse the kidney is going to be for your patient. The sooner the better. Like, decide quickly. Uh, and they're going, I, I need coffee, you know. <laughs> I, I got to wake up here. Uh, and so uh, this seemed to be a real problem. Uh, they want to do the right thing. They've got certain views about what the right thing to do is. And by right, I mean kind of ethically and morally right. Which of the two patients deserves to to get the kidney instead of remaining on dialysis or even eventually dying if it doesn't work out. Uh, so they want to do it, but uh, there are problems with human moral judgment, and especially under situations of sleep deprivation and other distorting factors. Um, sorry, so that's the, that's the issue. Uh, oh, I should, I'm sorry, I should have also said, all these people are working with me. Those are the two people up in Maryland. Uh, there's a big team down there. Uh, so the problem is uh, that humans uh, make mistakes. You know, there's big news for you, right? Uh, but they also make moral mistakes. They, you know, they say that things are morally wrong when they're not or morally right when they are, uh, and they do that in medicine and in important, you know, life-changing uh, medical decisions. And in particular, they do this for a number of reasons. They overlook certain facts that are morally relevant, Oh, I didn't remember that that particular kidney patient had three kids that depended on her or him. Um, and uh, they get confused by the complexity. Oh my gosh, there are like 20 different things on each side I ought to consider in deciding who gets the kid. I just can't deal with it, especially at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they get too emotional. You know, oh, but that patient, I can't let that person go without a kidney. They're such a nice person. I would just be feel horrible about myself. And they also display bias and prejudice. Uh, they will almost always, in the hospitals we're dealing with, say we should not discriminate on the basis of race or sexual orientation or any of the things that you know, most of us would agree on. Uh, but they've still got attitudes that make them you know, differentiate the, number, the kinds of decisions they make and, and give it to more to one group than the other, even though they themselves would view it as wrong. Uh, so that's the problem. Time pressure leads all of these sources of error, uh, amplifies them, you know, so that the errors are more common. So what's the solution? Uh, our group, at least, is suggesting uh, that AI might help. It's not going to solve it entirely, but it might help. Why? Because AI doesn't forget morally relevant features. If you program into the computer that these, this patient has this feature and this patient has those features, that other feature, you know, it's not going to all of a sudden disappear from its memory. It doesn't get confused by complexity. This is nothing compared to some of the things com the computer is doing. Not nearly as complex as that. It doesn't get overcome by emotion. Uh, we'll talk about bias later, but I think there are ways to get at least most of the bias out of the program. Okay? So, the idea is that maybe we can reduce the errors, the moral errors, by building human morality into the artificial intelligence system. Uh, that's the goal. But how are we going to do it? 
Well, one way to do it might seem to be that you take a moral theory uh, and apply it to the cases. So let's start with Isaac Asimov's uh, laws of robotics. Uh, a robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Second, robot must obey orders given to it by human beings, except when such orders would conflict with the first law. And third, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. Seems like systematic, but they're obvious problems, right? What happens if one human attacks another human and the only way to protect that human who's being attacked is to harm the human that's attacking? Well, then the law, the first law says you can't injure the attacker, uh, but you also can't allow the attackee uh, to be attacked. And so you know, the computer just kind of, you know, blows up. Uh, Second, uh, a human, well, one human might tell it to come with me to California, and the other human tells it, come with me to Florida. And then the, com you know, the computer doesn't know, the robot doesn't know what to do, right? Because it can't disobey either human. And so these rules are obviously uh, not going to be very helpful. Surely philosophers can do better, surely, okay? So the problem is, you know, when you're doing a top-down, uh, let's take the theory and apply it to the cases, which theory uh, are you going to work with? Uh, let's try consequentialism. You want to maximize the total good. Well, let's make sure that everybody has babies, right? There are going to be more people. Now you've got more total. Well, no, that's not going to work. So we maximize the average, right? So increasing the population doesn't help. Maximize the average good. Well, how do you do that? You kill all the people below the mean. <laughs> and the average goes up, okay? So a computer that was, you know, using these um, general principles uh, would create uh, a lot. Of, oh, and minimize suffering. How do you minimize suffering in the world over in the long run? Kill all humans right now. There'll be a lot less suffering in the world in the long run. So, so all of these consequentialist principles uh, you know, could lead to disastrous consequences if you try to program it in a computer. Is Kantianism any better? You know, there's this categorical imperative, never lie, and Kant himself says, you know, when somebody comes to the door and asks, where's your friend, you're not allowed to lie to them even though you know the person at the door is going to kill them if you tell them where they are. Uh, and so that doesn't seem to work. Uh, Ross, down in the uh, corner there, uh, has prima facie moral principles, but he says they're justified exceptions to them. Ju you can violate them sometimes with adequate reason. Uh, but when is the reason adequate? Oh, that rests in perception, he says. Well, that doesn't help you a lot either. That means you're supposed to look at the case and figure out you know, what to do. Uh, but how are you supposed to look at it? Uh, what's the method going to be? So um, this always happens. You lost my favorite picture in the entire thing. Uh, I should have gone over the slides. I, I had a little baby with its butt up in the air. So bottom up uh, is the other alternative. And it's a great picture too, it's this cute little kid. Uh, okay, so bottom up is, uh, is the other method. And instead of top down from a theory to the case, um, you can ask a thousand participants to describe a hundred moral conflicts in their own words and judge which acts are morally right or wrong and then set the computer loose on it, train a computer on, you know, um, on a certain set, on a training set, and get it to predict what the participant's going to judge in a test set, and then you can do more and more, and it learns as it goes along. Um, the problem with this bottom-up method uh, is, well, there's several problems. One is that it requires just too much data, uh, I think, to be realistic. Um, the second is often it's going to be uninterpretable in a way that if somebody says, well, why are you giving the kidney to this patient instead of that patient? Why did you give this person a kidney and let my child die or not get a kidney and then have to continue going through dialysis? You're not going to be able to give a reason that's intelligible to the person. Uh, and you can't capture individual differences because to make it work, uh, you're never going to have enough data on a single individual to get you know, an understanding for that person, it's going to have to be group data, okay? So we don't want top down, we don't want bottom up, so what we've been uh, trying to develop is uh, a hybrid of sorts, and that's what I want to explain to you. But first let me tell you what our goal is. Our goal is not to create some artificial intelligence system that's going to tell people 
what's really moral and what's really immoral, to find the truth. You know, I'm happy to tell you what I think the truth is, don't get me wrong, but that's not what this project is about, okay? Uh, instead, our goal is to create an artificial intelligence that reduces the common errors in human morality, that reduces overlooking facts, reduces getting confused, emotion, bias, and so on. Uh, it doesn't, it, you're never gonna be perfect, it's never gonna get rid of all of them, but you wanna reduce it, uh, the most common errors. Uh, and why is this gonna help us? Uh, well, we're gonna avoid takeovers by super intelligence. Nobody's mentioned Nick Bostrom yet, but, but you know, everybody knows that in 30 years the computers are gonna take over our world uh, and we're gonna all be in horrible shape. And this actually, I can tell you why later, but if you haven't read his book, then uh, that's not gonna mean anything to you. And uh, it can also increase our understanding of human moral thinking, because we're able to find out the computations behind, that's part of our goal, behind human moral judgments. And uh, it's also, we think, going to improve uh, human moral thinking uh, in various ways that I'll come back to. But those are the goals let me tell you how we're going to try to reach those goals. Uh, first of all, you can't do this for all of morality at once. You can't even do it for all of medical or health morality at once. So we focus on kidney exchanges. Uh, how many people know what a, how a kidney exchange works? So there are a lot of people that don't. Let me go through it quickly and you can ask questions uh, if you don't understand. But basically you have a, a couple here Donor one and recipient one, husband and wife. Uh, they, the wife needs a kidney. The husband says, I'd love to, I'm happy to donate. Uh, and unfortunately, their blood types don't match in a way that uh, the, the husband cannot donate to the wife. Uh, but there's another couple, uh, sister and brother in this case, uh, where the recipient uh, has blood type A, uh, donor has blood type AB, well now notice donor one, the husband, can in fact donate to recipient two, but now wait a minute, who's gonna give to this, you know, to the wife, why, why should this person donate when there's nothing in it for this wife? So, so luckily there's a third, right? And the recipient three has the blood type of donor two and donor three has the blood type of, oh, so you can switch the way the arrows say. And there's an exchange, and they do these up to five or six long. When you have a, a deceased donor at the beginning, you can get them much longer than that. Uh, but for, for live donors, um, there's a certain limit. One reason there's a limit is that you gotta do it all at the same time. Because if, uh, if you say donor two gives to recipient three, donor three might say, oops, that's, now I've got no incentive to, I'll just like sit back out. And so, uh, there's some timing problems here. Uh, but they work pretty well and they're, they're, they run around the country. There's one of them out of Maryland in the hospital that we work with. Uh, and they do use AI to try to help them, uh, but not quite in the way that we're suggesting, okay? Our suggestion is that you ask the folk, the general population, you could also ask experts in medical ethics if you can pick which ones, right? You could ask RBG, what would she do, right? But then you gotta figure out which person you're gonna pick. So we just go with the folk, uh, the you know, general online surveys, looking carefully at the demographics of the people uh, that we're surveying. And you ask them which features of a patient should determine who gets a kidney. We also ask them which features of a patient should not for those skeptics out there, let me point, we, we get way, we get 95% at least in everyone going race should not count, gender should not count, you know, ethnicity should, you know, even in North Carolina. Oh God, that's on tape. Uh, so, uh, so we do get them saying you should not do that, but we get a list of features which we th they, they think should. Uh, we then take those features and construct conflicts between uh, the different features, uh, between the approved features, that is the ones they think should be used. Uh, and then we ask more subjects, who should get a kidney in those conflicts? And now, uh, okay, so when we ask features, for example, uh, this is a long list and you certainly can't read it, uh, but we've got some preliminary data that suggests uh, hair color should not count. Oh, good, good people. Uh, but over there, you know, how long you've been on the waiting list counts, uh, 
how severe your medical need is counts. Uh, interestingly, the number of dependents counts, although as far as I know, no hospital in the U.S. actually distributes kidney in light of that. So one of the interesting things about this project is we've actually got a conflict between the way hospitals do it and the way the general population thinks it ought to be done. Um, and so uh, we pick you know, some of these, because we can't do them all, we pick some of those uh, features of uh, patients in order to decide uh, how to distribute it, uh, the kidneys, okay? And then we set up a website where there are conflicts between two these different features. So you've got patient A on the left and patient B on the right. Uh, you can see that patient A is a lot older and has serious drinking habit before diagnosis, uh, which patient B did not. Uh, but patient A has two dependents, uh, and patient B has none. Now notice, you know, they match on criminal record and additional health. But now we can what. Asking you what's right or wrong, what you should do in this case, now tells us how you weigh the number of dependents against age, for example. And so uh, by doing a whole series of these, we can figure out how you weigh these different elements. Weighing, I think, is the wrong metaphor, by the way, because it's not like 3.7 pounds. There's going to be all kinds of complex interactions and stuff, but, but the computer can capture that. Notice also that we allow people to flip a coin. And we have a big project on like, why do people flip the coin when they do? You know, what exactly is driving that? Uh, which is an interesting subject in itself, but I won't go into that unless you ask. Um, so uh, you can go to the website, uh, whogetsthekidney.com, uh, and, uh, and do a bunch of these if you want and see how you relate to, the, uh, to others. Although I think, don't expect it to look exactly like this because I think the website's changed a little. The result is you, you know, and, and you can also, by the way, vary the features. This is just an example. Uh, you can vary the features that get counted. And so you end up with you know, a bunch of different patients, one through eight, a bunch of different features, and they're varying in different ways. And so you're going to end up with a nice data file about exactly, you know, how, pe you know, what happens when people weigh two against five or three against seven or seven against two. Or, and, uh, and by doing that, you're going to be able to analyze how much weight they put on the different features. Uh, so uh, we then uh, set machine learning loose. Uh, Tina, you're going to have to explain how it does it to me, because I'm not the computer scientist in this group. Vincent Conitzer is. Uh, but uh, it's able to determine which features are affecting people's judgments, uh, how those features interact with each other or get weighed against each other, if you like that metaphor. Uh, and, and then it creates a model or an algorithm that predicts each individual's uh, moral judgments. So you can say, this is the model that tells us what you're going to say about the 10 cases that you haven't faced yet based on the 110 cases that you have already given us your answer to. And of course, uh, it can learn uh, as it does 10 more, because now you're up to 120, OK? There are obvious problems. One problem. Uh, is bias. Uh, we're going with the folk and their judgments, but we want to correct them and say, this is the judgment that you would make if you did not forget something, if you did not get confused, if you did not get emotional, and if you did not base your judgment on some factor that you yourself say it should not be based on. So. Uh, humans are going to have those biases, and you would think they're going to be in the judgments that we record. But the solu our solution, although we admit it's only a partial solution, but it's, it might be better than the way it's done now, as was mentioned in the last talk, uh, is ask people which features should not be in the algorithms. We already asked them that. And then include only those features that people think should. So we don't specify whether the patient's male or female or black or white or Hispanic or European. Right? Uh, and so then their judgment can't be based on that if they, um, if they don't know those features. Uh, now, it's still possible that some uh, you know, other features will slip in and there will still be. Uh, it's not a perfect solution, uh, but all we're trying to do is get better than the way it's done now. Okay? Uh, another problem uh, that people often raise is the problem, what you might say, of humanity. Uh, will AI? Uh, replace doctors, right? So now 
We don't even need to wake up the surgeon, except we still have to wake him up because he has to do the surgery. But we don't have to ask him at all. We'll just tell him, this patient's getting prepped. Get on over here. Uh, no, we do not want to do that. That is not the goal. At least, certainly not at this point, and I doubt ever, but that, there's a disagreement about that within the group as to ever, but certainly not now. Uh, instead, we want moral AI to help doctors. Uh, that if you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you're told you've got to give it to patient A or patient B, uh, then you can say, well, oh, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of a little bit confused and I'm really tired, but, you know, I think I'd probably go with A. Then the, the person on the other side of the line might go, good. That's what the AI said, too. Now, you're much more confident. But if the person on the other side of the line says, well, the AI said B, then you go, okay, well, I need to think about this a little bit more, right? Or maybe we need to contact, you know, a third party, you know, to figure it out. You might have to build a procedure when there's a conflict, but you get confidence when there's, le when there's not a conflict, uh, and in that way it's going to help doctors, okay? How should we transition to this program in hospitals? Very slowly. And we're not talking about tomorrow, right? We're talking about, you know, trying it out, you know, first testing it in samples that are not in the actual making decisions, then slowly move it in, see if it's helpful with the people who want. So a lot of people think that a problem with AI is it's just going to take over tomorrow. Uh, but th there's none of that in our project, at least. Uh, we're hoping that there'll be some help uh, many years from now, okay? Is it limited to, AI, to health? No. I think our method can apply to many, many other moral issues. Uh, take, for example, uh, military drones, autonomous military drones. You want to find out what they, how they should be programmed, right? Uh, you've got Arkin down at Georgia State, uh, or is it Georgia Tech, um, saying there needs an ethical regulator on it. But how do you get the content of that ethical regulator? It's not utilitarian, not Kant. We want to say, this might help you. How do you do it? You ask people, maybe experts, maybe the folk, to describe moral problems uh, that might arise in realistic situations that the drone might face. You ask them which features are morally relevant to determine whether the you know, drone ought to bomb or wait or, or bomb someplace else. Um, you construct scenarios where those features conflict, just like we did for the medical case. You ask them what, which act is wrong in conflicts in that case. Uh, you extract models for individuals, right? You learn and improve by applying it to new scenarios. And then you compare individuals and groups, okay? You can say, let's do individuals first. I am so looking forward to this program because this program could explain my wife to me. You know, like she does this judgment, I do this judgment, I'd like to know why. Well, if she has a different model, then we can compare the models, in theory at least, uh, and, uh, and sit, get a little bit better grasp on how our value systems differ. But what about groups? When I moved to Duke, I thought, so what's the difference between North and South Carolina? How are they really different, you know? And how's Durham different from, you know, rural towns in North Carolina? How, how are their values actually different? Well, you can do it, right? You can take a sample out of each area, uh, construct a model. I mean, again, ideally, this is in principle, and get a better grasp on what the differences are, okay? So we've got a lot of benefits, we think, um, of this way of doing things. Uh, users uh, who use this system are going to become less likely uh, to overlook features, features that they themselves see as morally relevant, right? Because if they're using the system, the system's going to bring that feature in, okay? Users can tell uh, when they are biased or confused. They make a judgment, and then the machine does something else, and they look at it a little more and they go, oh, I guess I was confused or I was doing this. And they can actually uh, learn about themselves that way. Uh, uh, users can tell why they disagree with others, how many, which other people are going to disagree with them. I mean, this is all very pie in the sky kind of stuff, long in the future, uh, but it's part of what motivates us. 
and moral psychologists can yes. learn how uh, humans make moral judgments. Because I do a lot of moral psychology, and the, the standard methods these days are, you know, you do a survey, maybe you do some kind of intervention, but you never actually get down to what are the computations going on behind these moral judgments. Uh, and so one thing I must admit that motivates me about this is not just to help the doctor at 3 o'clock in the morning, but to help me at 3 o'clock in the morning when I'm sitting there worried about, you know, my next experiment and how I ought to structure it. Uh, it can help us learn about ourselves and about morality in general. So I know that's really pie in the sky, a lot of, you know, big claims there, and we haven't done any of it yet. Uh, so I welcome your questions uh, about any of that.